Welcome everyone to the Leaders in Communication Speaker Series. Leaders in Communication Speaker Series is a monthly um, series that brings media leaders and influencers, newsmakers to the Newhouse School for candid, insightful conversations with students and guests. And tonight I am honored and pleased to welcome award-winning sports journalist and author, William Roden. I am Olivia Stomsky, director of the Newhouse Sports Media Center. And William, thank you so much for spending this evening with us tonight. Hey, Olivia, thank you very much. Great to be with you. Well, we could talk for hours as you and I have discussed on a ton of um, topics, but we're gonna jump right in. Knowing a little bit about your background, um, graduated from Morgan State University, moved on to the Afro-American newspaper, Baltimore Sun, Ebony, News, uh, New York Times, now the undefeated. I first have to ask, did you always want to be a writer? And, and what was it growing up that led you to being a storyteller? Uh, yeah, well, um, thanks again, uh, Olivia, for having me. And um, yeah, so let's say, um, yeah, I, I think I always have wanted to be a writer. It's kind of like the only thing I knew <laughs> in a way. I remember my first, um, my, my parents gave me this uh, child craft set of encyclopedias. They were orange and they're like 10 of them. And they had all these stories. And I remember I was seven, eight years old and I was sitting down one Christmas and there was one particular story I liked and I was copying it. So my father came in and he said, uh, what are you doing? I said, I'm writing a book. He said, oh no, <laughs> that's, not, that's not how you do it. And um, it's so great that years later, I think 2006, when my first book came out, uh, 40 Million Slaves came out, uh, I was blessed that my father was there. And in my remarks at the book, I said, Dad, it took like 40 years, but I got it. Here's the book. So, yeah, I think that uh, consistently, that's probably the one thing that I want to be and still want to be as a writer. So you finally figured out what writing a book was all about. We'll get back to that. Um, fig fig yeah. Figuring it out. Still figuring <laughs> yeah. it out. <laughs> Every day is a process. Every day. Um, we will get to that as uh, Amanda has put in chat. To all of the guests tonight, if you have questions, please don't hesitate to put your questions in the chat. I have a ton of them, but I will try my best to get to them as we start to move forward. So one of the things that the Leaders in Communication really aims to do is to have an emphasis on current trends and, and challenges to help our students to keep pace with quickly changing communication industry. Um, as you were going through college and starting your career, what kind of writer did you want to be? Yeah, you know, we, you know, I saw the question and I thought about it. I've been thinking about it for the last 48 hours. I said, wow, that's a question because it's, it's still evolving. I just wanted to be a good writer. I mean, I just, I just wanted to be good. You know, I wanted to make sense. I wanted to be clear. Um, I wanted to add in my copy and uh, you know, have, um, you know, come back with not a lot of question marks, but I guess I just always wanted to be, uh, good. I, I loved, uh, I loved the process, um, of, uh, interviewing people. I love the interviewing process. I loved, uh, the interviewing process. I love to hear the stories. I love to hear the stories that I was going to tell. And so I, I guess my thing was, and to continue is to, uh, tell somebody's story, interview somebody, uh, and, 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 and bring back the essence of what they were trying to communicate. You know, I, I told somebody as recently as the last column uh, that uh, if I write a, a, a column about somebody, I will not exhale until I hear from them. And they tell me, hey, that's what I said, you captured the essence, or, or you didn't. So from, from the very beginning to now, I think, uh, the kind of journalist slash writer I wanted to be is somebody who could tell the essence of somebody's story or tell the essence of whatever the issue is to kind of get inside the, uh, uh, the issue, the meaning of things. So um, yeah, that was, it is, and probably always will be. One of the things we talk about in many of our classes here at Newhouse is having the responsibility of that voice telling someone else's story that oftentimes wouldn't otherwise be told. How do you deal with that responsibility with, you know, wanting to make sure that 
you tell their story to the best of your ability with keeping their trust, being honest, as well as being factual. How do you deal with that as a writer? Yeah. By being honest, by being trustful, by, by, you know, by trying to follow the truth where it leads. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I think that particularly being uh, being black, being an African American, and uh, and I, I found it, you know, I, I mean, I, I came up through black institutions, you know, Morgan State, HBCU, um, uh, the Afro, you know, Black Institute, Ebony Magazine. And when I was with the black institutions, I guess I always felt that um, I was carrying a sort of flag, particularly when you, I would go in the archives, I look at all the archives of the Afro, I look at the archives at Ebony Magazine, just, and just the wonderful stories uh, that the black press told about black people, because in the mainstream press, the white press, uh, black people didn't have birthdays. They didn't have, they didn't get married. You know, they didn't die. They were just problems. So at, in the black press, I felt that it was a responsibility to continue to, to tell those stories of, of complexity, of pride. Then when I transitioned into the white media, I, I carried the black press with me. You know, the black press has always been with me, still doing the same thing, still telling uh, those stories about black people, black issues. Um, you know, uh, with, with the complexity, with the humanity, the dignity, um, you know, that kind of thing. So I always felt, um, I always felt, and, and to this day, writing, you know, with the undefeated, uh, that the idea is to tell these stories, particularly of African American people, uh, with all the complexity, but with the dignity, the humanity, uh, uh, the trust, the faith, all those things that my predecessor in the media is like Sam Lacey's of the world. Uh, I, I just feel that um, it's now my turn and that's what I'm passing down to either students I've got or uh, the Roden Fellows, we'll get into that later. But just the idea that that uh, you guys are, are, are torch carriers, you know, you, you're, you know, so uh, I'm not sure if that's what you asked me, but that's, that's my, that's my, that's my answer. <laughs> That's exactly right. Well, and one of the things is we start talking about being honest and holding the responsibility of telling other other people's stories. One of the things that you and I have discussed at length is the clear lines of commentary and opinion and, and how you form them. When is the time for you to have an opinion on things? When was it in your career that you felt that you were allowed to or needed to voice those opinions? And how do you decide your timing on those? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. And that's the question of, of that's the question of, of now, because part of the problem uh, with, with media is that these lines are blurred between what's perspective, what's commentary, what's opinion. For most of my career, uh, probably beginning with um, uh, at, at the Baltimore Sun when I was a jazz critic, that's the first time I really stepped out and part of your assignment was to have um, a, an opinion, but more or less a perspective about a performance, uh, and particularly, you know, about a musical performance, um, about a musician's life. But mostly, I remember at Ebony, I read a book, uh, a collection of essays by Norman Mailer called Existential Errands. Um, and I think I uh, may have read same time a collection of essays by, essays by Jane Baldwin, uh, Baldwin. But that's the first time when I really became intrigued by perspective, by kind of point of view. But it really, to answer your question, at the Baltimore Sun, uh, when I began being a jazz quote unquote critic, that's when I began um, uh, forming a perspective. Well, what do I think about this? What do I think about? And back then you were given license. Okay, that's your job. But clearly, you know, man, uh, you know, uh, it, 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 Olivia, it, there still was, and to some extent is, um, a line, a sharp line. I know I, I teach um, students at Arizona State at the Cronkite School. Can I say that? <laughs> we'll dump that over later. It's fine. But but, but it's it's a it's a it's a uh, class in opinion writing, commentary, 
And I think that what many of them said, the biggest adjustment is I'm teaching them to unlearn everything they've learned in school, you know, because I want you to have an opinion, but it has to be reported. Uh, it has to be uh, heavily reported, sourced, and that kind of thing. It's just not your opinion. You could do that on Twitter. So, yeah, but I think that um, at the Baltimore Sun is when that started. And then uh, at the New York Times, uh, I got there in 82 and I began writing a column in 1988 from 1988 to 2016. So most of my career has been as, as a columnist. Um, and uh, so, yes, but I think that you raise a great question because that's the, I think that's the issue uh, of the, the day in journalism is why the muddies have become so, um, the, the waters become so muddy because everybody's got an opinion. Everybody's got something to say and, 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 and uh, don't need sources. You just say it and it becomes a truth, you know. What do they say? I'm speaking my truth. Well, damn, yeah, I don't want to hear your truth. I mean, what, what's the source of your truth? You know, <laughs> give me some, what's the, who said this? Okay. You know? <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm going to jump back from my questions to, to some questions from attendees. And, and one of the questions we have here, um, first of all, wants to thank you for your work on the sports reporters um, missing that, that program. And the question is, is if you have a favorite story from those days, that sticks out to you um, as you look back on, on all of all of the stories that you've had an opportunity to tell. Um, well, if you just talk about the sports reporters, uh, it, for those who didn't know, that's kind of like ancient history. But the sports reporters was a show on ESPN uh, that I did from like nineteen. I mean, from yeah, nineteen ninety, I think, to uh, twenty sixteen when it shut down. Uh, it was, you know, Mike Gupica, Mitch Album, uh, Will Bond, uh, you know, uh, and a lot of the great stories from that period of time were things that never, never reached the air, just conversations we had <laughs> behind the scenes. Um, but, I, you know, I, I really, you know, for me, man, you know, every, uh, even to this day, it's, you know, the thing we love about our business is like every day, just the possibility of what's going to happen not knowing it, um, even in this pandemic, who would have thought, you know, who would have thought, Olivia, I mean, who would have thought uh, a year ago that, you know, everything was rolling along. I was at the big 12 tournament and everything was rolling. Who would have thought that with, with just like this, it would all be shut down. So, but I think that what I did and probably what a lot of journalists is, oh, cool, yet another adventure. So, to, to, you, know, you know what I'm saying? It's like, and I think that's, how I look at it. So when people say, well, what's been your biggest story? So, well, man, it's, it's what, tomorrow, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, it's, it's coming up. That's the next big thing. And, and you almost, uh, not that you forgot what you did last week, but you kind of do. And it's okay. What's, what, what, you know, what's, what's coming up? How, how can I make sense out of this? So, uh, again, I'm not sure if I answered the person's question, but it's like, it's like tomorrow. What's, what's, What's coming up? What's the next thing, you know? Yeah, I, I also often say as journalists, we're almost like line cooks. It's it's the hottest <laughs> story right now. We gotta cook it as fast as possible, make sure it's the best it is. And then as soon as it's out the window, we're on to the next order. And that's kind of how <laughs> we tend to work. And, and by the way, and yes, and that is kind of demoralizing in a way in that I mean you enjoy you write a column or whatever, it's kind of good. Right. You know, that's it, but then <laughs> you know, it's all to the next one. You know, you know that I, I tell that to the, uh, to the you know, one of the editors I work with, John X. Miller, and we'll finish, and the story's up, and it's okay. On to the next one. You know, <laughs> you know. So. And, and everything changes so fast. Um, you know, obviously, you wrote Forty Million Dollar Slaves. You talk about the evolution of the role of black athletes in your long career. How have you seen that role change? Um, it continues to evolve. Um, I mean, even now we're dealing with, speaking about things changing, we're dealing with Deshaun Watson, right. uh, the quarterback of the Houston. <laughs> Last week, two weeks ago, everybody was, you know, he was going to be the president of the United States. I mean, he could run for mayor because he was, and, the, you know, Houston was saying this, you know, we wanted to be our quarterback. He's got great virtue, great this. Great, I mean, it's just wonderful. Then flip of a dime, now all of a sudden, you know, depending on which side, he's public enemy number one. I said, well, wait a minute. 
uh, and I'm saying this, A, this is a journalism issue, but it's also a black athlete evolution issue. So wait a minute, one minute this guy is here and could run for office, clean cut, everybody's saying that. Now he's kind of pushing back against the status quo. He's pushing back and really getting ready to make a statement. Now all of a sudden he's a bad guy. You know, and this is not to discount the the accusation. There are accusations, but it's 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 so and I and I think that if you are an African American athlete, male or female, throughout history, whether you're um, you know, Jack Johnson, whether you're uh uh Flores Griffin Joyner, whether you're um Wilma Rudolph, whether you're Marion Jones, whether you're Serena, well, you know, there's always this thing that's potentially hovering to kind of take you down, uh, whether you assist in the takedown or whether, so, so I, I guess, and I've been really attuned to this evolution um, over years. You know, my mentor at the Afro American was Sam Lacey, uh, who's the long, you know, longtime sports editor of the Afro American newspaper in the Hall of Fame. Uh, he passed away at 100. And I remember I used to always talk to Sam about these issues, uh, you know, um, whether it's Joe Lewis, uh, Jackie Robinson, uh, how you act, uh, how you're representing your community. It's just this, this tremendous weight, not a burden, but a weight. So, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I've seen it. I mean, you know, uh, Colin Kaepernick. I mean, we. I mean, all the way. There's just been this line, and and it's, and it's a, it's a mantle that white athletes don't really have to carry. Now, I think white female athletes, um, along with you know, have to carry a certain mantle, whether they know it or not. And I think many of them have done a a great job. If you look at the WNBA. I think a lot of women really do understand. Um, the, the, the weight that they're carrying, the mantle that they're carrying, the, the, the battle that they're carrying. Uh, and and, and they're, I think they're carrying it very valiantly and brilliantly. I think that uh, the black male athletes um, come in and out. You know, they kind of come in and out of it. You know, they have to be slapped. I think you have a guy like LeBron James who reminds everybody. And now when many of these young black athletes are seeing peers in the community can murdered by the police, I think probably about eight years ago, 10 years ago, I think it finally dawned on a lot of them, you know, the damn, you know, they, outside of me making money for the universe or whatever, they don't really care about me either. So I, I, it's, it's been a fascinating uh, evolution, uh, particularly as athletics has become this third rail of American culture and has really, has really been out there. Uh, you know, so it's been a fascinating evolution to, to, to watch and write about. In your career, you, you have covered ev nearly every sport. I'm sure there's got to be something that you haven't, but whether it be boxing, football, basketball. Curling, not curling. I've not, I've not done curling. Okay. Uh, see, now we know curling. Yeah. I always say badminton. That's always my go-to. I did, I did. I actually did do badminton in the, uh, <laughs> yeah. In one of the Olympics, you know, because when you watch the, yeah. you watch, uh, I think it was Pakistan versus somebody else. And I'm like, wow, I've never seen badminton play like that before. <laughs> That's not how my dad and I played in the street. Uh, exactly. Kids. Exactly. Yeah. You got it white all over the dog. It was like cut thrust. Whoa. <laughs> but I'm I sorry. Love <laughs> I love that when you get, you know, blown away. This is now, then you become a fan so quickly too. Oh, absolutely. Then you come back you know. to the, you come back to the backyard barbecue. You can never, you can never play, <laughs> you can never play bad <laughs> like that. Yeah, your standards are completely different. They're completely different. <laughs> <laughs> but, but getting back on topic, not each of these sports allows or treats their athletes the same. And as we start to see, especially in recent time, whether it be the NFL versus the NBA on how much of a voice, how much of a pulpit our athletes are given, especially black athletes when it comes to social change. What has really yeah. been your observation here on how strong athletes can push against that? What, what changes need to be made there? Yeah. Well, the first part of the question, I mean, it's really been fascinating. This whole, the whole pandemic has just uncovered and laid bare so many things from privilege you know, to 
uh, you know, power. so it was fascinating to see the NBA bubble and to see the NFL. So, and, and you know, um, the NFL, let's start with that. You know, when you saw black athletes, particularly after these, the range of shootings and all that, whether well, it's all the corporations inside and outside of sport, let's say the NFL, everything was all about Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter. You could put it in the end zone. You could put it on your shoes. You could, you know, same thing with NBA, you know. But I think, and then, you know, Roger Goodell gets up and he's talking about, yeah, you know, Black athletes is, have been critical. They're the foundation of uh, the NFL and blah, 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 blah. And then you have some really shrewd young Black guys. Yeah, okay, that sounds good, man, but how much... What we have like three black coaches, we have like one black team president. You know what kind of business is the NFL doing with with black vendors? You know, and 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 the same thing in the NFL and in the NBA. When he said you, you you know when guys were kind of hemming and hawing about not playing, they they turn you know they turned the the, uh, the arena the pandemic arena into like you know like an HBCU. You know, you can do anything, you know, put scribble off things. But the reality is that where is the power? And I thought it was interesting that, uh, well, just a couple of months ago, Mark Cuban said he was going to stop playing the national anthem before games. And all of a sudden, the NBA, this liberal NBA, stepped in and said, oh, no, 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 you got to play the national anthem. And Cuban made a great point. And I think that one of the things that this pandemic has shown. And I've noticed that you see everybody flying American flags, but what this pandemic has shown is that there are millions of views of the United States, of that flag. And that's what Cuba was saying, is that, you know, a lot of black folks, same thing as, you know, the, 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 uh, the bondsman on the plantation was praying to, to a Jesus and the white slave owner was praying to a Jesus and they, and their prayers and what they want were diametrically opposed. And I think it's the same thing with, with this flag. And Cuba says, so why am I going to play it? Because what this whole pandemic and the and and, and what we saw in Washington uh, on January 6th, John, man, we, we live in a very fragmented America. So when you play that national anthem, everybody's looking and listening to that with different ears. So let me just shut it down. So um, I, I just have been fascinated by the power dynamic that's been exposed and, uh, you know, sort of how much power do you really have if you're playing, if, you know, you know what I'm saying? That's kind of with all of us, but, but for the sake of argument, you ask the football players, basketball, well, how much power do you really have? You know, so, and that's still the million dollar question. Um, and that was the substance of $40 million slaves. Um, and, and it's um, still true that what's wealth without power? I mean, wealth does not necessarily equate to power, you know? So um, I forgot what you asked me, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the things that, speaking about your book, uh, one of the things you talked about, and this is a question from, from Amy Johnson, I'm glad that she brought it up. Uh, one of the things that you talk about is the Negro Leagues and $40 million slaves. Um, with Major League Baseball officially elevating the Negro Leagues to Major League status, what is that message that, if any, that Major League Baseball is sending? We effed up, <laughs> is, what, is what it's saying. We should have done this. Um, and I know there's been a lot of, uh, you know, I think whatever, it's fine. You know, it's good, okay? Uh, you should have acknowledged it, you know, when a lot of these guys were allowed to, but you did it now, fine. You know, um, it, I, I filter it through a glass half full prism. That is, it's great. Um, I, I don't necessarily need you to validate me, but it's good that you are. That's fine. The logistics of it, the logistics are on you. How are you going to define? But the fact that you decided to acknowledge uh, Negro League Baseball is great. I guess the point Though I, the larger point I was making in 40 Million Dollar Slaves about Negro Leagues and all that was just the importance of Black institutions. I'm a firm believer in uh, 
black institutions, the power of black institutions. Um, you know, like I said, I went to an HBCU and um, uh, most young black students now are going to PWIs, predominantly white institutions, though the largest, uh, uh, the largest concentration of young black students are at uh, HBCUs. And um, so, so I'm a huge believer that, and that was really the point of those two chapters of major league. So what did we give away? You know, when we, when we kind of caved in to desegregation uh, and, and, and the black community, you know, seg uh, it, quote unquote, what white people call integration was uh, uh, like a, a tornado that ripped through the black community and blew it into millions of pieces. And we're still basically putting ourselves back together, uh, you know, and and so is the nation, you know. So um, that's really what those chapters were about, about uh, then and even now the power of black institutions, you know. So um, that's what I was trying to get across in in forty million dollar slaves of of, uh, of of yeah of desegregation and. You know, people like Rube Foster, who had a vision, a vision of, uh, of, 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 a, of a Negro League, of a Black Negro League, that eventually would be strong enough to go in as a whole to Major League Baseball. And you think, you know, you think, I know, Olivia, this is kind of, but somebody asked me, what would have happened whether it was Black quarterbacks or something, had we, had, had we just kind of done this in like 1940? And you think of how far the country would be, had we just... You know, and I, and I, you know, I guess we have to go through this stuff as this, as this young country. But how far we could have been, and that cuts across if we would have, you know, begin to see the power of women, and not to treat them as second class citizens. And we, same thing with with black folk. You know, it, 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 we'd be so far ahead, but we didn't. So here we are, you know, fighting and struggling and, you know, grinding. Well, and and sticking with, you know if changes would have been made and talking about, especially on the collegiate level, the importance of black head coaches in colleges has been discussed and you and I discussed it. Um, you know, I, I think it's interesting, your opinion on, on the lack of black head coaches and the importance of, of making sure that that changes. Yeah, you know, it's funny, before we got online, I was thinking about uh, my high school coach, this is my high school coach, I don't know if you see him. This is uh, Sherman, Sherman Howard, who was my high school coach. And, um, you know, Mr. Howard, that was 96, but, you know, he, he introduced me, and this was in Chicago, and Mr. Howard was, you know, I didn't realize at the time, at the time that he was the oldest living NFL player. And just the stories that he would tell us that kind of went over our head when we were young, but it was about a, a, a black man telling these young black young men about what it was going to take to survive and thrive in a, in a racist world or nation that was not designed for us to succeed, you know, and he handed me off to coach Banks in Morgan State because they were had been childhood friends of Chicago and Coach Banks at Morgan. And, you know, and again, at, a, at, at, an, at a Kalia, Coach Banks, um, same thing, you know. So not saying that I'm sure there's a whole lot of, you know, mo most guys in the NFL now, most of the black guys in the NFL uh, probably did not have a black college head coach. You know, they did not have that. They were not blessed like that. And this is not to say that they didn't have good experiences and that white coaches can't, you know, coach black guys because they, they do. But I think there's a really special bond. That's like, you know, I was looking at the final four, I mean, the, the tournament today, and there are white coaches, white male coaches coaching women. Well, I'm sure they're nice and they have a nice relationship, but I think there's, there's something about having – a, 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 a black coach or a woman coach talking to women, a black male coach talking to men about this is what it's going to take to make it, you know. So um, 
Yeah, I think that's really, really, really important, which is why, um, you know, I'm, I'm still looking at the tournament and my bracket is based on where are the black coaches, <laughs> you know, that's my, you know, uh, so yeah, but I think it's really, um, it's it's really, really important. And I think it's, un, it's, it's important that white folks understand when we make these arguments, we're in a climate now where when black folks talking about, you know, we advocate for black people, a lot of white people take it like you advocate against white people. And no, that's not, no, that's not it. I'm not, a vote for black folks is not a vote against you. And I think that's kind of been this narrative that's been, you know, spew, you know sold to people in the last 20, 30 years uh, that no, uh, you know, that we could all go to the beach, but racism and continued segregation kills everybody. You know, if you look at, if you look at the NCAA, just for the sake of argument, remember there was a time when they said, well, black folks were, were kept out of uh, major colleges, right? They said, y'all can't play basketball. Well, now you look at it, you know, you know, young black men, particularly power, power five conferences, young black men and women probably make up probably like 75, 80%. And has the industry suffered? No, it's a multi, it's grown into a multi-billion dollar industry. So yeah, diversity works, you know, but people, it's, Olivia, it's just such, it's so hard. <laughs> it's so yeah, hard, to, it's just so hard to let people know that, man, no, we can all go to the beach, you know? But there's a part they got. They got to deal with the hatred. They got to, and and we just have to. It's just such a grind. To uh, anyway, that's not what you asked, but that's. Uh, but you know, it, it it it. Well, go ahead. Ask your question though. No, I mean one of the things that we talk about here at Newhouse quite a bit is the idea and the fact that equal rights does not mean taking rights from others. It means equal, and we talk about this is especially in the sports classes. Um, when it comes to women in sports, that there is not a finite number of places for us. We can all be successful in the place that we need to be, especially if we support each other along the way. And that is something that for some reason, I think we all just have to keep fighting. And yeah, and, and you know, that's, that's, and I'm glad you mentioned it because that's yet another issue in our industry, meaning the media. You know, this whole thing of, um, I was looking at the numbers from the Institute uh, for Diversity and Ethics in Sport. Our industry is probably one of the, meaning the sports journalism industry, and you can extrapolate this to, to uh, graduate schools. Some of the great graduate schools of journalism around the country are just overwhelmingly white. And 85% of sports editors uh, and 82% of sports reporters are white. Um, you know, and you know, I mean, to this pre-pandemic, I'm still in, in, in baseball press boxes with like one black reporter. And, and I think that kind of flows into, I know a question we're gonna get into later is how do we, how do we as an industry regain trust? Well, right. part of it is that we gotta desegregate our industry. It, it, it's evolving into this middle and upper middle class white industry, whether it's graduate schools and all that. And that's not the truth. That's not the reality. You know, that is not the reality. And, um, you know, so yeah, to get back to your thing, yeah, there is room enough for everybody, but this is a very difficult, this is sort of a difficult question. And, and, and again, that's why HBCUs are so important, you know, uh, because we kind of have to create our own, you know, um, so. Well, one of the questions that, that has popped up a couple of times from um, our audience is, how do you think athletes can acquire more power in their respective leagues? What, from your experience, has worked for athletes to make sure that they have their own voice and there's power behind it? Well, they've got their own voice, but having your own voice and having power are two different things. You can have your own voice. They do. they got Twitter, social media. Everybody's got a voice. You know, that's what we talked about a little Everybody's got an opinion. Everybody's got a voice. That's not necessarily power. How do you get power and control? Um, ownership, 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 ownership. You own the product. That's why Negro Leagues were so important uh, because you, you kind of had, had some power. Um, 
I mean, that's kind of that simple, you know, or, or if, if not within your industry, it's, I'm wondering right now, black athletes in the NFL, the NBA have a, a really unique opportunity. Um, you know, you're, 80% of the NBA, 67% of the NFL. But 30 years from now, when you look back, what will that mean? You know, what will that mean? What what will that have meant? Will you have come together and built banks? Will you have come together and built schools? Would you have come together as a group and said, you know what? Uh, we need uh, black doctors. We need black attorneys. So we're gonna make sure that we, with this collective muscle and power, this is what we do. So. Um, that's how you create power. It's, you know, when the Milwaukee Bucks during the pandemic got together and said, you know, we're not playing, <laughs> you know, and that's power. That's power. Now they kind of stopped it after, you know, after a day, but that's, that's power, you know, you know, power and control. And, and we'll join, you know, jump into discussion about the pandemic, but you know, if you look back at the timeline of the last year, I feel like no one, you could have written it in a book and no one would have believed some of the things that we have all lived through over the last year, um, but yet they still happened. Um, one of the things that I see and I hope to be a good thing that came out of this time is there's really been a shift, especially in our industry, towards storytelling. When sports stopped, people were glued to their TV for any 30 for 30. They were reading every bit of sports story information that we possibly could. And I've spoken to so many people and, and the misconception that when no sports were happening, that there weren't stories. You and I tend to be the kind of people that say when sports stops, that's when the stories are actually plentiful. How did you see your job change as a storyteller? Do you feel like there is more of a hunger for those stories and, and personal information now than there was before? I think that, um, I think we had gotten, particularly in sports, a little lazy. We got gotten lazy, you know, particularly guys who, you know, the beat writers and all that. You just sort of let the event, you know, you just kind of ride out the event. You know, you go in the locker room and you just kind of, you know, you, you you know you let the, the you let the event dictate, and I think that suddenly when that access was stripped away, and by the way, I'm not sure if it's coming back. And that's one of those consequences. I think people they've always been trying to kick us out of out of locker room clubhouse, and they have now succeeded. So I, I think that it 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 forced us to become hungrier and leaner and more creative, uh, and and really. Uh, uh, hunker down and become creative with how we reported stories, told stories, um, found those people who wanted their stories to be told outside the parameters of the teams. That's still going to be there, no matter how much teams circle the wagons and they have these Zoom things that this is who we want you to talk to. There are plenty of people outside of that who still want to talk. So I, I just think that uh, this is um, made us work harder as journalists uh, to get to stories, to tell, uh, to tell stories. Um, and I'm really fascinated by those students who are coming of age during this pandemic, you know, like right now, who are freshmen, and got right now, you know, uh, how, what's going to be the evolving, uh, how are they going to use technology? How are they going to use, um, reporting, how are they gonna tell these stories? Because it's not gonna stop. We're gonna to continue to, to break stories, tell stories, offer perspectives. Um, so yeah, I mean, in terms of me again writing columns, um, it, uh, to the extent that I deal just with a lot of perspective and, and you kind of know people and you call people those kinds of things. And then we're, this is just such a bizarre time. Um, you know, uh, just not, but I don't know, you said, do, do we want more? Do people have their appetites have become more, have, have our appetites become um, greater without sports? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, 
I think we become aware of the extent to which it was just background music, and which we were just the heck. I watched, I watched all the baseball playoffs. And I've never done that before. You know, my thing is, I only watch what I cover. You know, I don't know if I should admit that, uh, but I watch what I cover. But now, yeah, so I watch everything. <laughs> you know, both foot, football on Monday, great. Tuesday, great. Wednesday, great. Thursday, fine. You know, throw in a little Friday there, fine. <laughs> you know, uh, so. Uh, but I don't know if that speaks to the substance of, of how important it really is as a cultural phenomenon, or it's just like just a diversion, you know? Well, in, in so much of that, I, I feel like, you know, I'm with you. I, I'll watch it. I was, I watched more cornhole than I ever thought was going to in my life just because <laughs> it was on and there was competition. Right. Um, and so as we start to move forward, but you know, when we start talking about those stories, and especially some of the wonderful pieces that you have done, we, we go back to a topic that we kind of started with, is that in order to get those stories, you have to have trust. And for so long, some of that trust was built over time. We were interacting with each other in person. It, it may be a player you saw at practice over and over again. Um, things have changed, right? Now we have to build those tr that trust in other ways. How do we do that? How do our students starting from scratch, as you mentioned, the freshmen right now, how do they build those relationships? What should they be doing to build that trust? You know, that, that's, that's a great question. It's kind of hard to go back to, um, you know, when I was like 19, 20. But I do think that there are some, there are some principles of success, or well, I don't want to go that. You know that are timeless. You know that 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 were legitimate in 1919. They were legitimate in 1929. Legitimate 1939. Legitimate now. There's principles of you know of of working hard. You know, being on time, being resourceful. Um, you know, uh, um, getting to just getting to know people. You know, I mean, um, a building, you know, uh, we're not going to be, and because of social media, heck, no matter what type of lockdown, social media opens everything up, you know, so you can get, you can, you can, we can still, we'll still, we're still connected, you know, we're still connected. Uh, and, and I think that what students have to realize is that this stuff, excuse me, what you mentioned, the trust. It does not happen uh, overnight, you know. It does. It does not happen overnight. I mean, it's like you, you know, you go, you could plant plant an oak tree in your backyard, and you could you could water it fifty times a day, you know, with big buckets of water. It's not going to grow any faster. It's probably in fact you're probably going to kill it. It just takes time to nurture it and all that. So, uh, so that's, you have to understand that these things take time. But while it's taking time. What are you doing? Um, are you uh, building your, are, are you just working on your, your craft? Uh, you have so much available to you now. You know, you're at these great schools of journalism. I, but I still think, uh, you know, writing is fundamental. It starts there. But now I think you have to be able to do everything as, as you're teaching there. You've got to be able to, to write it, shoot it, edit it, send it, uh, tell stories and multiple platforms multiple ways you know um and, and i think so so that will never uh go away but in, in terms of building trust um you know that that's a good question olivia i mean you, you know you just be honest yeah you know, just 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 be honest and be quote unquote authentic now what what does that mean i don't know but um yeah I don't know. So that, that, that's a five minute question. So I don't know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I think it's probably comforting to everyone that's joined us tonight. I mean, if you don't know, we don't know. Like, I think this is how you have to do it. Yeah, yeah right. really. When was the last time you were in a pandemic? You know, yes. none of us, none of us has been here before. <laughs> right. Well, and, and that's the thing is it's, it's we're all trying to figure it out. And as long as we figure it out together. And one of the questions from, from an audience member is whether or not, especially talking to our, our student sports reporters, whether or not the responsibilities of a sports reporter has changed. 
I agree with you. I think a lot of us got very lazy. We talk about just what happened. You know, I've heard, I've heard people say, just get out of the way of the game. Um, that being said, a game is two to four hours and we talk about sports for 24. So has the responsibility of a sports reporter changed, especially in light of what's been going on with social change, with the rise in anti-Asian hate crimes, with everything that's happening within the United States, let alone worldwide? Has our jobs changed? And I think that goes into the diversity or the lack of diversity in our industry. Mm-hmm. You know, um, yeah, so, you know, I think that you have to, um, uh, um, you know, when, when you ask that question, I was just thinking about has it has it changed? You just have to, to get, get out of your own silo. I think before, you know, you're a baseball writer, you're a baseball writer, that's all you want to know about, you know, and probably a lot of baseball writers still all they want to know about, you know, but I, I think you just have to become more adept at synthesizing. And I think that people who are African-American, people who are of color, uh, people who are, who come, you know, who are from different, co- I think that by definition, they tend to synthesize more. I think that sometimes as a quote unquote white journalist you might just kind of wrap yourself around you know, it'll wrap whiteness around you and say that's enough you know that's that's enough this is my cocoon it's who i am uh and you know you kind of be bright or something but i think that um i think that you have to really learn to synthesize much more and that's things that african americans have always had to do you know, from the time we got on these shores, we had to really synthesize, you know, they, they, they take away your language, take away the drum, take away this. So we had to immediately begin to synthesize. I think a lot of white people, well, we're not synthesized. Well, they, a lot of them, they just stole, but that's another conversation. But, but I think that, I think, um, synthesize more, uh, um, you know, I, that's the biggest thing I think, just synthesize much more than you, this is a huge world out there. There are cultural shifts. And, um, you know, just be more aware uh, of, uh, of other, you know, other, it sounds really simple, you know, other cultures, uh, even other sports. I mean, you know, um, um, yeah, I don't know. I, you know, I just, it's kind of hard. I, I know that I probably would attack my job in 20, 21, the same way I did in 1972 when I started collecting a paycheck. You know, I would probably be doing the same thing because the same issues, the same issues that I face in terms of racism and and that you know exists now is just another form. So I didn't really have to think you know, these questions we're having now. I didn't have to think about it. I knew I knew what the mission was. I I knew what the mission was. In 1970, I would have known what the mission was in in 19 uh, in 2021. I knew exactly what the mission is: oppression, racism, how to conquer it, and my role as a black journalist. You know, and it you know what I'm saying it wasn't a big mystery. It was not a mystery at all. The mystery was how do we get more black reporters? How do we attack racism? How do we you know? And, and maybe I don't know. Maybe if you're quote unquote white. That's kind of outside your, you know, well, it's, it's not my part of, you know, I don't know. That's, I'm here, just, I just want to cover the game. Or I just, you know, want to go to the game and drink beer and have dinner afterwards. And, but, you know, you know, uh, this is like sports is like this country club. And, uh, uh, you know, I'm on the country club, you know, and that was never, I so I wish I had that luxury. I wish I had that luxury in a way. But so, no, I've, you know, so that, that, I, I guess it's, I'm trying to beat around the bush to answer that question. No, I was always focused. I, and I would have been focused, I was focused then, I would have been focused now, you know. Mm, yeah, what do you think about that? I think that's great. And you know, <laughs> it, it's funny because, you know, for, for those people that have joined us today, you and I had a conversation of, of our dislike for the term of difficult conversations because right. they're not difficult to us and they're definitely not difficult to people that live them every day. Exactly. Yeah, that's what they said. Well, it's time to have difficult conversations. Difficult like what? <laughs> we, we thought you're the difficult conversation. We're, we're, you know, and I'm sure that you kind of get that. 
as a woman, if you're if you're a woman, I mean, part like I, I'm reading this book called Hood Feminism that I would suggest feminists, white feminists, to read. It's Hood Feminism uh, by Mickey Kendall. She said that it's notes from the woman that a movement forgot. And as she's talking about, yeah, we're going to have some. Just talk to my white sisters, you know. We're going we're going to have some quote unquote difficult conversations. But geez, well, it's not difficult, you know. Uh, you know, how can we move this boulder up the hill? So yeah, um, and, and uh, you know what, you know what, Olivia, I think it, and I've really been thinking about this throughout the pandemic. This whole idea of privilege, you know, I mentioned about these uh, journalism schools that are predominantly white and privileged. And privilege has really been exposed as not, demo, you know, Democrats with pri privilege or Republicans with privilege or independent. A lot of people say, damn, I have privilege and I like it. And you have to make it, you have to make a choice. You say, wow, you know, you know, you have to really look in the mirror and say, you know what? I like this. I like having two or three homes. I like not having to compete with a lot of, you know, and, and I think that's, that's been an offshoot I guess uh, there's a realm of realism as we go to the next phase of the pandemic. It's, it, you know, just like Hurricane Katrina, um, it really pulled the covers off of privilege. Who could escape and who couldn't? Who, who, who got to higher ground and who drowned? You know, so I, I think those are the conversations we have to have and are they difficult? No, I don't know, they are just, it's probably the most difficult conversation is a conversation you have with yourself when you look in the mirror. That's the difficult conversation. You know, what do I really say? And then, you know, I'm a good liberal person, but what am I saying when I, when I look in the mirror and what am I saying to people? Cause I don't want to be on the wrong side of history. So ultimately you lie, you know? So yeah, those, those are the difficult conversations, the conversation you have with yourself. And one of the things that, that we have talked about is, is both you and I in our careers have, have, have worked across the board when it comes to sports, but we see so much mirroring, whether it be social issues, changes, uh, we talk about legal issues, we talk about, um, you know, rights. What is it about sports? I mean, you've worked with music as, you know, when we're talking about your time working in jazz, you've worked in news. Why sports? What is it about sports that transcends the voice that you have created throughout your career and has given you this opportunity here? You know, I always found that uh, I, I kind of, you know, same thing with, with uh, when I was writing about jazz uh, and I've seen the commonality in sports is that here in the music, when I was writing about, you know, jazz and, and you had all these tremendous black musicians, you know, who created all this wonderful music, but they didn't really have the power. They didn't own the record companies. They didn't own the means of distribution. Uh, they weren't the critics. You know, you just created this music. You know, then I, you know, you start writing about sports. You see the same thing. See all these black athletes who, you know, they they uh, they uh, produce. They are the foundation on which these leagues are built, but they don't have power. So I said, these two things, so th those are the prisms through which I saw myself as a black man, that um, you had all this creativity, but without power and control, what does it mean? You know, and, and I found writing about sports, you know, and, and using that as a prism, you know, like you're saying, everybody kind of comes to sports and they good, we're gonna relax and we all come together. You know, we're, we're in one big stadium. We're not Democrats. We're not, which we're, cheer, we're cheering for Alabama or we're chilling for all, what, until you begin to talk about these power dynamics. Now, all of a sudden people, well, we, we listen, we just want to escape. We don't want to deal with that kind of stuff. So um, I've just found sports and as it's evolved, a very compelling prism through which to talk about things we've talked about tonight just these race, racial dynamics of, of power and control or lack of power and lack of control and how you get it. Well, and, and one of the questions we had is, has sports general in general lost its leisure and fun status? And 
you know, when sports is your career and, and you've been able to look at it through the eyes that you have, maybe it never had that. Um, well, I mean, I, I still think it's not, the, I mean, I still enjoy competition. It's not like I go out to the ballpark, let me look, where's the racism? You know, I mean, you know, no, I mean, I, I, I you know, it'd be great. To, no, I, I like competition. You know, it's just, I, I would love to, you know, be one of those kind of people just go to the game and you just look at the games. Mm -hmm. I, I wish, but it's just that racism is in, so deeply embedded in our in, in this country. There's not one facet of it that's untouched. The the, the women's movement, the gay rights, you know, LBGT, every single movement is shellac with racism, and it really has hindered our ability to really, really preach the real gospel to the rest of the world. I mean, I, I think you know, probably sexism is probably much more insidious globally than racism. But this movement in the United States can't get past first base because it is so infected by racism that it can't even, I guess, they get past first base. So yeah, I, I mean, I still enjoy. I mean. You know, I, I, you know, I watched the Super Bowl. You know, um, I actually went to the Super Bowl uh, just because I wanted to see what was the Super Bowl like in the pandemic. You know, so I still, I still enjoy our business, and I still enjoy that. I still enjoy the of journalism. You know, being that first writing that first draft of history and all that. But you can't ignore racism, and if you are committed to pushing this boulder up the hill, making this country live up to the, um, the covenant of his foundation, uh, as my great-great-grandfather did, and his grandfather, my great-great-grandma, you know, then everybody takes this baton and you run your leg, you know, as hard as you can. You know, that's just, and if you're, you know, that's what I'm committed to. Um, but yeah, I mean, do I enjoy, um, you know, do I enjoy watching a good foot race? Yeah, <laughs> you know, <laughs> of course. <laughs> you know, I enjoy the popcorn and all that, but you just can't ignore this stuff, you know what I mean? 100%. Uh, so I have two minutes. And so of course my last question has to be, you've had a storied career. This has been an honor for me to speak with you, but when you decide to stop writing, when you are, an old man sitting on the porch. Oh my God. Man, yelling where? at whoever you choose to. I will yell at Olivia, you. where is this going? <laughs> what do you want your legacy to be? Uh, hey, I think as long as I, God, I, I'll always be writing. I mean, like most, I, I, this is forever. Uh, the legacy is things like the Roden Fellows. These are young people, uh, you know, that, uh, uh, that the undefeated supports. These are six kids, six young grits from six HBCUs. Uh, we've just named our fifth class. And every time I look at them, that's the legacy of, of having five classes of young African-American kids from HBCUs and sending them out to the world. It's not hundreds, but it's six every year. And uh, that's the kind of, you know, that's really the only legacy is um, planting those seeds and um, watching them grow. That's, I think that's at a certain point you're, your life. That's all it's about. How's that? I have, I have said in the past that I cannot control who has been successful in our industry in the past, but I can at least do my part to help change that for the future. And I can't yeah, thank yeah. you enough for the work that you've done to do that. Yeah, thank you very much, Olivia. Much appreciated. It has been an honor. And thank you all for joining me. Um, William, I loved our talk tonight and I just can't wait and look forward to what you will write next. And I can't thank you for all the work that you have done for our industry, but more importantly, for the students and the people coming behind us. Thanks, Olivia. Same to you. Keep teaching. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. This will be the Leaders in Communication conversation with sports journalist William Roden, and I can't thank you enough. Stay safe, everyone.